What do we want and how do we get it? What makes us come alive? Psychotherapy helps you find insight in your life. Psychotherapist Charlotte Fox Weber has always been fascinated by what our desires are and what makes you come alive and what motivates you. Weber shares her wisdom about inner peace, mental resilience, and growth and adversity in Tell Me What You Want. A therapist and her clients explore our 12 deepest desires. The book is an exploration of 12 fundamental psychological needs we all share, taking us behind the closed doors of therapy in 12 themed chapters. There are 12 stories that are told. This is not a self-help book, but it is a very interesting deep dive into the human conditions. Charlotte Fox Weber allows us to bear witness as she guides her clients toward profound insights, change, and growth. Through her compassionate telling, readers can understand and celebrate their deepest and darkest longings. Each one of us, at moments in our lives, can feel lost or confused, grappling with those big questions. We often don't know how to get what we want, or even what we want or desire. Yet we all share certain universals, such as to be loved and to love, understanding, to be understood, to have power, to acquire attention, looking for freedom. We want to be creative. We want to belong. We want to win. We want to connect. We want to control. And we want what we shouldn't want. In this interview, you're going to hear Charlotte Fox Weber talk about her book and so many parts of the human condition. I really think you're going to love it. I'm Paul Krauss, and you are listening to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you are looking for an ethical and efficient billing service, check out Therapist Billing Services. That's therapistbillingservicesllc.com, a billing service created by therapists for therapists. All right, let's get to the interview. Welcoming to the Intentional Clinician, we have Charlotte Fox Weber. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Excellent. My pleasure. And I'm very excited to discuss your new book, Tell Me What You Want, A Therapist and Her Clients Explore Our 12 Deepest Desires. And I was been reading this book. I got an advanced copy. I was very excited about that. And you, you go over all these different desires. Um such as to be loved and understood, to be long, to, to, um, to have power, uh, to have what we shouldn't, to, to control, to connect, to be free, to receive attention, just to name a few of the 12. And you have a lot of stories in here about different um, therapeutic encounters and what you learned and maybe somewhat uh, what the clients um kind of were going through at the time. And I have to say, it was very interesting. Um, I hadn't read a book that about psychology that wasn't like a textbook type book or a self-help book. This is neither of those. I feel like it's like a, it's like a book about people and stories, but yet you weave in psychological concepts. So I remember the only other books I could compare this to were kind of like Irvin Yalom's novels. I don't know if you've read any of his. Stuff. Oh, I, I love his work. So, yeah, I, I really think it's really cool. So I was just curious a little bit about um, how were you, how, how did you start writing about your therapy work and inspired this book? It's so I, I always loved reading in literature and stories and felt like studying literature was my kind of introduction to thinking about our inner lives more than more than science for me and understanding a character's development so i i've always loved and appreciated the kind of compelling details of human relationships and i think therapy consists of many different parts of a story and i i found it more natural to write stories about encounters than to try to kind of structure my book in a way that would be step one step two which just isn't my way of communicating or understanding things 
I think that's great. I do think, um, you know, you can, throughout the last hundred years, people really have read books and a lot of movies and audio programs are based on books and stories. And we, I think as humans really love stories. So I thought this was a really unique book. Um, I read a lot of books on psychology all the time. And I think the ideas of like these, you had observations from your from these clients, obviously you disguise their names and yeah. occupations and you had quotes from them and you had quotes from you. And you talk about when you were puzzled or how you were interpreting it and then trying to figure out how they were interpreting it. And I think that's an interesting way of, um, making meaning. And I think you can learn as a listener or a reader, you can learn from this book, um, without feeling like you're reading a textbook. I felt like I was reading uh, short stories. That's what I felt like I was reading. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad to hear that. And at the same time, of course, sometimes there's a wish for a formula that can, can spell out and manualize what to do, how to deal with life. And and there's a place for that, but I think for me, what feels more authentic, I know it's an overused word, but more natural and and real and vivid is to delve deep into the personal idiosyncrasies of how therapy works. Oh, yes, that's a very good uh, point. I'm going to ask you about some of the stories. Um, but before we get into the stories, I was curious about how you came up with these desires um, that you've kind of highlighted throughout the book um, in these stories. I was curious. I mean, I, where did you get this? This is pretty cool stuff. I I found from the start of my career, that desire was a subject that didn't come up very much in, in my training. And in conferences, I I feel like it's recently become a popular topic, but it's still often associated with erotic longing. And, and then there are goals. And desire is different. And I found that whatever the circumstances People came to therapy struggling with desire one way or another. It was a kind of core conflict, no matter what was happening. Lack of desire, wanting something that wasn't possible. I, there was some kind of story around desire and and recurring themes really interested me in different cultures and the way some desires are acceptable and some desires are taboo and it depends on what's kind of socially appropriate for for how much we're supposed to want something yes and that would make sense um i believe from what i was reading earlier you have a bit of a cross cultural experience yourself that maybe open this up you lived in the us at some point right yeah, I, I grew up in Connecticut, and I think I've probably always felt like an outsider insider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I moved to Paris when I was 16, and then I finished school there, and, and then was at university college in the UK. And I was much more comfortable being an outsider officially. I think I probably feel more at ease when I... I don't have the expectation of fully belonging. Oh, interesting. I like that. Yeah. So that, that's a, that's a good one, a good juxtaposition to, to talk about your experience. And, and I do think it's interesting because as a therapist, I hear desire all the time, but I also yeah. had no training on it. Oh, right? that is interesting. So it wasn't, it wasn't just in the UK for me. <laughs> no, I had zero, I had zero training. I had, I, I mean, besides, you know, people would say, you know, if somebody was like, I want to be a superstar, but they're like laying on their couch and smoking cigarettes all day. And they're not like becoming a musician or an artist or something. Right. It's like, oh, well, we have to help them with solution focused goals or something right. like that right. or existential well, what do you want existentially at the end of your life? That was as close as I kind of got, like, like, you know, that deathbed wishes sort of thing. Mm. So, Well, and I think that our profession is sometimes a little bit too patient mm. and a bit of restlessness can actually kickstart something. So from my own experience of being in therapy, it 
for many years with many different therapists, I I waited for therapists to kind of push me or agitate me in some way, like to to make me think about the bigger picture and think about how I was getting in my own way. And and it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Therapists and allowed me, almost indulged me at times to just sit with misery, frustration, struggle, and maybe plans, but plans are not the same thing as really thinking it through. So in a very kind of plain spoken way, I think the question, what do you want is a useful starting point for anyone. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I think, um, you know, sometimes when people come to therapy, you have to figure out what type of trajectory you start with, but you have to keep changing it. So sometimes the trajectory is, I want to get rid of these bad feelings and this situation, but it turns into something else. Or sometimes people right. say, I'm just dissatisfied with my life. I want to do this. So the language is there, right? But we have to, we work within the medical system, at least in, in the US and the UK, as far as I know, we have to deal with different like codes and we have to word things in a certain way. But with our clients, we have a lot more creativity um, mm. because if you help somebody make meaning, in my opinion, and you help somebody get what they want, oftentimes a lot of the symptoms will go away. Mm. Whereas the medical model is like, focus on the symptom, focus on the symptom. But if right. you just focus on the symptom, um, people they're like bored of that. How does that, okay. So I feel better a little bit, but I still, I'm, I'm still not getting to where I want to be. I still don't feel full and excited and alive and enriched. Right. And I think that's what you're getting at with these desires. It's like, if you really go for what you want a lot of, the, uh, and you start making progress, some of this depression, some of this anxiety just naturally kind of, kind of abets, I think, because you've got something to focus on. Yes. And, and I think it's always a work in progress. We are in motion. And when we arrive at satisfaction, it's, it's fleeting. And mm -hmm. I think accepting that is, is also quite liberating that it's not as if you have total, utter permanent fulfillment and you know what you want and then you get it the end. It doesn't really work that way. So I think and reframing our attitude towards desire and embracing the motion of possibility is also, it's also quite life enhancing. Yeah. And I think what you just said, life enhancing um, is because you're right. There's not like some static level we reach. We have mm. to learn how to live with ourselves and our circumstances, or we need to change them, you know, like that. And that okay. involves desire and want or a lot of pain until it pushes us to do something. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking of pushing us to do something, uh, and I'm trying to remember what chapter it was, but there was a story about a woman who worked for this famous architect. Um, and she is just really talented and really interesting person, also cross-cultural. Um, oh, yes. How do you say her name? Her name is pronounced Sing. Sing. Okay. Okay. And that was, let me see. I, I just found the chapter it's the here. chapter on understanding. Oh, on desire. understanding. Yes. Understanding. Thank you. Um, and in that book, she works for this architect and this person is sort of util using her and mm. her kind of like people pleasing perfectionist sort of persona and her, her lack of confidence to have her create all these projects and he puts his slaps his name on them and he's the one in the famous magazines and he's getting all the money and she's getting paid all right but she's just frustrated and she th i think she, in my opinion i have no idea but she seemed to like think their relationship was deeper than it was mm. um and 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 she seemed to put a lot of weight into his approval um and then throughout the story you and her struggle a lot with um trying to help her open up to becoming her own person. And what is she? I don't know. I don't know what the, it was so much there, but like, I don't want to narrow it down, but she went through this whole struggle because she was going to be featured in a magazine. And then he got wind of it and tried to, 
and and was like shutting it down because he didn't he, his ego was so strong and she was like heartbroken or something and that was only part of the story i'm not giving it all justice but how did you kind of like in the relationship i saw you i saw you kind of push her a little bit but you didn't like spell it out you know you didn't you didn't you kind of waited patiently for her to kind of figure it out how how did you uh, what's your kind of take on how, how you handled her it's <laughs> It's really difficult at times to not be a know-it-all as a psychotherapist. And when I catch myself feeling like a know-it-all, I I can f- interrupt myself and allow for the uncertainty that I don't know how things will play out. I I think kind of making space for surprise. And allowing for the struggle, I, it's a two-way thing. But there are times when I'm sitting across from someone and I think, oh, no, I, I know where this is going. Or this relationship sounds like a disaster. Or, of course, this person is cheating on you. I mean, there. I don't know if you have those feelings also when you just oh, yes. have to hold back and allow them to come to their own realization and then there are times where I think, again, restlessness can be useful. So I, I will intervene if I think this is actually a really unsafe situation and I'm going to say what I see or what I'm what I'm feeling strongly. In the case of someone like Singh, she, she was so ambivalent for so long. People... People tend to be ambivalent about abusive relationships and see it in some ways and don't see it in other ways. And it it was so important to kind of honor her individuality and autonomy in, in making choices for herself. But it was it was also a lot easier for me to hear about this horrible sounding boss without this seduction I'm, and i don't mean seduction just sexually yeah. but I, I, when when we're not in love with someone it it's a lot easier to be dispassionate and can be calm about it and and not feel pulled in in the same way and i think i think that people i have certainly experienced this myself people get seduced by their jobs, by their bosses, by the company they work for. And that seduction is a very strong grip that is hard to walk away from. Yes. And and I think there was so many layers of understanding. I felt like it was like a cascading waterfall because she had to understand herself. She had to mm-hmm. understand the role her job played in her marriage, in her life, in her self-esteem. She had to understand her boss and his motivations and she couldn't do that without the pain of trying something new, which was she put herself out there for a big project and she got accolades. Right. And, and I feel like she was struggling, like you said, ambivalent. She was going back and forth because like if she was going to be, this is my take, who knows? You got to read the book, people, uh, you know, if you're listening. But if she try, if she followed what seemed to be what people were asking of her going, oh my gosh, we need more of you. Like your work is amazing. Then inevitably she had to step into a little bit of a spotlight or have her name on something and not just his name. And then that would cause her, her old identity and her old role and her her comfortable zone to crumble. But she didn't know if it would. Right. Right. So she took a risk and I think understanding takes great courage. And Mm -hmm. actually, I remember when my older child was three or four years old and I said, do you, do you understand about something? And he said, I don't want understand. And it really stayed with me because as much as we seek understanding, we also can find it really difficult and sometimes irritating. We don't want to totally see what's right in front of us. And it makes it makes us have to deal with things if we understand something. So sometimes 
we're too exhausted to understand. Even if we're obsessing over something, we might still be kind of looking away from allowing ourselves to understand what's what's quite obvious. And obsessing can even be a weird kind of detour. Obsessing over something is still not thinking about that something in a clear way. And I think a lot of it is to do with ego Mm -hmm. when it comes to work. And someone like Singh and, and most of us are uncomfortable allowing for ego. A part of us wants to put ourselves out there and shine. And another part thinks, no, that's so mortifying and modesty is good. And it's, it's, sometimes safer feeling to serve another and to be the humble server of an egomaniac and kind of feel virtuous for the self-sacrifice, the tenacity of putting yourself aside for the greater good in a way. Like I think I think that working incredibly hard can can actually be a con- concealed ego plan that that goes on a detour. I like that. Um, it, and now you're getting into a psychotherapy concept, uh, or many actually, but one of them I'm thinking of like the many facets of ourselves and mm. and understanding that at least the way we understand most human brains is if they get into a place or maybe they don't have to get into a non-stressful place, but you can actually contemplate that you have many conflicting desires and many conflicting ideas and also conflicting stories about the self and other people. And I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things we could say about that, but I do believe humans in a way we're we're both seeking comfort and some sort of predictability, but we're also seeking um, excitement and change yeah. and so yes. these things kind of counter each mm. other and and i think there's totally and i think you know what is that is that thoreau that said like most men was this like 100 years ago whatever most people live quiet lives of desperation where they never get to use their voice is that thoreau mm-hmm. or something I, like that? I love lives yeah. of quiet desperation i mean i don't yeah love <laughs> right actual desperation but it's it's a great concept to think about and a struggle that I think we all go through at different moments. And And so, yeah, go, go, keep going, sir. I think sometimes uh, I get asked if it's really kind of terrible to have an identity crisis. And that's a question I get asked quite a lot. Like there's this fear, what am I having a complete identity freak out? Is this an existential crisis? Like, a dread of having a crisis. And actually I think a crisis as painful as it can be is also an opening and, and it makes space for possibility and it's stagnation. That's, that's really the silent killer. And, and we all have stagnant time periods as well, but I think sometimes a crisis is a kind of startling wake up call that actually something needs to shift. I agree. I think most people think they're coming to therapy voluntarily, but I don't really think it's voluntarily at all because it's often some type of at least inner crisis that Mm -hmm. says I need something different. So I need to Mm -hmm. seek a therapist because at least I can talk to them and I'm paying them money. So they're not Mm going to tell anyone my information or judge me as well. Obviously we we judge sometimes to make sure we have don't have to put you in the hospital or, you know, your life's not in danger, but yeah. trying to stay non-judgmental about our approach. Yeah. Um, and then that crisis leads to opportunity and it leads to possible change or at least yeah. a choice um, yeah. where we might feel like we don't have a choice. And speaking of that, um, there was another story. There's so many good stories in here, but it was, I believe, in the chapter on desire, straight up desire, where there was this man who my goodness, I don't know how to even comment, but he, he's married for a long time and he's still married, I believe, according to the story. Mm -hmm. And he, he, all of a sudden in his later years, I think his fifties, I think it was 
him and his wife stopped having sex and he didn't want to like talk to her about it or something. Mm. He was like restraining himself. And so then he would go have sex with escorts Mm. and like sort of brag about it like a teenager to you. And, and then he would like just go back to his wife and he, like he was getting his needs met elsewhere, his desire to feel wanted, um, which was important to him. But yet he seemed unwilling to broach the topic with his wife and he just sort of led the secret life. So I don't know. I was curious, you know, how did you navigate your own feelings about his behavior? Because I felt like you really had empathy for him and you didn't lose sight of the fact that even though he was acting out and sort of doing these sort of things that we would in society say are not a great idea and cheating Mm. on his wife, you know, that you didn't like, you know, judge him or get angry and throw down the gauntlet. I, this will sound very controversial, but I, I think that infidelity is hugely stigmatized Mm -hmm. and having an affair does not make someone a bad person and not having an affair does not make someone a good person. Mm -hmm. But I think that there can be a huge amount of shaming around this issue and, and then righteousness and defensiveness and avoidance from people who don't want to sully the picture they have of themselves. And Mm. I think, I think that we judge what we don't understand. And I, actually came to understand how this man ended up feeling justified in sleeping with escorts. And a lot of it was the kind of the desire for desire itself, Mm -hmm. even if it was a fantasy, even if it was an illusion, but also it was permission to kind of express something that it didn't feel safe to express anywhere else. And I think over time, couples can become incredibly familiar with each other, yet it it strangely becomes less safe to kind of say certain things sexually, to, to take risks of trying on new roles, to kind of have adventures. It, it's almost like you get sedimented in being a certain way, and it would be it would be too strange, too risky to expose some hidden part. And it's really interesting the way the way strangers can allow for something deep-seated to come out. Yes. Um, and I thought it was, you were really approached him with kindness. And I feel like he really, he really wanted to change his behavior, but he had such trouble with it because of, some other deep seated issues I want people to kind of read about, but I actually do agree with you a lot because I think because of the human nature, our concept of love and romanticism, which is a whole nother podcast is off. And I think constantly, I think everyone listening to this podcast could admit that they might be having an affair with their phone, with food, with alcohol, Definitely. with drugs, with television, Definitely. with their job and, and, and We're not all loving addicted and, to something or, sure. or fighting some kind of dependence. <laughs> yes. Always. So it, 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 I think, you know, looking at it that way, you're able to kind of step past the societal, like, you know, breach, so to speak, and, yeah. and, and kind of really got down to, I think you, I think you pinpointed, I can't remember exactly, but you started pinpointing like when this started and it had something to do with his mother and mm-hmm. he kind of didn't want to go there, but mm-hmm. you were kind of pulling it out and, you know, you gave, he, I feel like he finally felt like he had a choice. And I think before, in the beginning when of the story, he felt like he was compelled to do this and he had to like tell you about it. And I felt like towards the end, he felt like, okay, I could do something different here. Yes, he he was able to, to have oversight and clarity about his choices and mm-hmm. understand his priorities and values. And I think I think it's important to have space to consider what each desire means to each of us individually, because desire is something different depending on where you are. And for, for this man and, and for many of us, 
we we want to be wanted and that can be incredibly hard to talk about and to admit to and and feeling neglected feeling ignored feeling undesired can be a very subtle kind of rejection that that almost feels like death but doesn't get acknowledged because it's it's not a kind of official crime but feeling feeling unwanted is heartbreaking Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I'm going to I'm gonna quote your book here for a minute. So this is an example for the listener, because I've been talking about the stories, and I talked about how this is not a self-help book, but you could really help yourself by reading it. So here's a little quote from that chapter. I once asked a Yale brain researcher, scientist, Amy Arnston, do human beings want to feel desire so much in the first place? Or why do human beings want to have Uh, feel desire so much in the first place. And she said, I think this is a very primitive circuitry that allows an organism to thrive. Pleasure in eating, drinking, sex, and being in the right temperature all allow us to be in the correct physiological conditions, she said, and to continue our species. Without desire, this is you, without desire, why would anyone do anything? What would it mean to be human? Desire is possibility, energy, motivation, Desires are the backdrop for action. With the exception of occasional blissful moments of contentment when we want for nothing, we feel listless and directionless with that desire. Desires light up pathways for us, shape our experiences, and move us forward. Mm. Yeah. Any comments on that? I think, again, embracing the fleetingness of satisfaction is Mm -hmm. utterly liberating. Because expecting that you can kind of get something and then you have it and it's sorted, it it never really works that way. And actually embracing the kind of push and pull of desire itself allows for the struggle. We, we have tensions within us where we we seek change, we avoid change, we move our direction of travel. And and I think that allowing for the energy of desire is, is a really expansive process as well, because suddenly it's possible to kind of make space for surprise and discovery and you don't have to instantly have everything. I think one of the reasons we get so addicted to our phones and eating compulsively and shopping and consuming is the kind of immediacy of of thinking that we must have things right away. And deprivation is is part of that as well. I mean, it, when everything feels urgent and actually allowing for the space of desire and kind of being interested in it makes it makes it a more engaging and exciting process and i think i think we are still often shamed about wanting in general so it's more acceptable to want to go on holiday or in america to want to go on a vacation than to want to be loved, especially if let's say you're married already and you have kids and then it's really difficult to even admit internally sometimes that actually you want to feel loved or you oh, want yeah. to feel loved by your parents and you're a grown up. Whatever it is, I mean, I, wanting wanting something emotionally is uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, I think people want depth in their lives and in their relationships and in their, and in, in how they make meaning, but they're also afraid of it. And, and part of it is you're talking a little bit about kind of cultural messages, unconscious cultural messages that kind of yes. come out, you know, even the, the idea of consumerism, it's fine to want new kitchen knives you know, because that's a, something you can hang on to. It's tangible and it costs money yes. and it's an exchange. But to like desire to be recognized by 
uh, people at your office and to, you know, mm. s- uh, say, wow, you know, you really did a good job or, oh, right. or, you know, I held the door open for somebody. And even though it was altruistic, I still wanted them to say, oh, thank you for holding the door. Right. Yes. Yes. And why did you want the knives? <laughs> What's yeah. it really about? That's right. That's what we often kind of look right over. And I think going deeper is actually invigorating and, and that includes the discomfort. So it, giving yourself permission to, to want something to, to really think about what it is you want and, and be okay with that. Yes. And I, I love that you just, re- you really dove into this subject. I love this. And I think that people are really going to get a lot out of this book. And another thing about your book that I found unique was that you told the stories, you told your topics, you threw in a few um, philosophical quotes or quotes from scientists or researchers, mm-hmm. but you re- that was, that's like the minor part. The story is the main part, but then you highlighted, which I thought was pretty interesting because I don't see this very often. You, you bolded some vocabulary words and I love that because it, I don't know. I used to just, when I read textbooks, I would like in, in a, you know, whatever high school or something, I would like skip to the bolded vocabulary word Mm. and like find out what it was and then go back and read the chapter. So I wanted to ask you about just some of the words I found really interesting because I, and topics and phrases, because I think when people get language for what they're feeling, what they're going through, it gives them power and it gives them insight and it gives them hope. Mm. Whereas if your vocabulary is stunted to whatever region you grew up in and you haven't really read many books and maybe you just watched in America like all these thousands of sitcoms we have where people don't even talk about anything except their cars and their bodies and I don't know mm. boring stuff um you know you're 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 unfortunately you're deprived of of some meaning you're deprived of deeper deeper feelings so uh I'm just going to throw a few out here, but early on in the book, this is the first uh, story about a dying person that you helped uh, in the last couple of weeks of her life. Um, You talked about the curtain of rejection. Mm. Our fear of rejection holds us back when we want and fear love. When we recognize our basic desires, we can distill the myths from facts and the shape of love becomes real and possible. This might mean sitting with our own uncertainty or realizing what we already have. So this curtain of rejection, I I just found that, and there's way more you said about it. I, I just found that intriguing. Love and loss are so uncomfortably intertwined. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be a lot easier to love what's far away, what's not available and not to get too close to the possibility of really embracing love and being exposed to rejection and mm-hmm. loss and pain and it's it's one of the reasons we we can love something in nostalgia and we can love a dead person wholeheartedly we can we can love a star we've never met we can love the idea of something. I mean, as long as it's at a distance, but, and it's kind of pixelated, but I think, I think there's risk in, in getting close to love because it hurts. Someone gets hurt when, when you really love anything, anyone, you have something to lose. I, yes, that is very, uh, cogent information for people. I think I see that a lot in therapy. People will say, here's my list of things I want. This is not the symptoms I want to go away, but this is the list of things I want. Mm. This is recently an anonymous person said to me, I need lots of money, a girlfriend and more time. And I said, um, game, let's work on it, dude. Like, let's Mm. do this. Right. But (laughs) what order, (laughs) what priority and what are you willing to do? Because if you, you know, all of these things could be attained, Mm. but we we have to figure out why and where Mm. and what. 
and the, and and sim- and similar this is a different person but similar people have told me they want these things but yet we'll work on it we'll work on it we'll work on it we'll work on you know trauma reprocessing we'll work on like all these coping skills and then they get to the moment where they're stepping up and they have the chance to get one of the things like let's say a girlfriend or something like that yeah. and they just run away because oh, yeah. or because sabotage or sabotage it right and it's like Oh my gosh, because it's so, it hits you to the core to take the risk that you might say to somebody, I desire you, do you desire me back? Oh my God. It's It's almost better to love a celebrity and write a bunch of unrequited emails Mm. and letters to them than to feel that rejection. Sure. Yeah. Or, or be attached to some familiar unhealthy relationship. Oh yeah. Oh, I see. We see that every day. And uh, it's kind of terrible and and painful and you know it, but it's what you know. <laughs> the risk of having something actually work out is is daunting. And I think I think that enjoying life is weirdly hard. Even if even if we're incredibly upset that we're not enjoying life and all we want to do is have fun and enjoy ourselves. It's it's not a totally easy thing. And it's even vulnerable to really enjoy yourself. I think so. I think it's complex. Um, Speaking of that, I want to ask you about a few more more vocabulary words. And then I do want to ask you uh, definitely about (laughs) <laughs> what we shouldn't want and what we should My to get favorite. to that. Okay. <laughs> but uh, one of the vocabulary words I loved, and I remember this maybe from Albert El- Albert Ellis. Am I saying that right? Musturbate. Musturbate. Yeah. Page 22. Mm. He said, uh, well, yeah, we musturbate about how life is supposed to be. One of my... Mm. One of my most hated words, should and supposed to. Expecting relationships to follow rigid scripts. This never works, and our demands leave us profoundly exasperated and often alienated from others. We only begin to grasp what enough means when we understand our desires. And you keep going on about, and you explain it in more detail, but masturbate. Mm-hmm. I, I love that one. I think that's the one we should all add to our vocabulary. What are your I thoughts? I love masturbate. I, I heard Albert Ellis himself, I, he would kind of instruct people to stop masturbating because someone would say, "I." but it it must be easier than this. Like it, it shouldn't be this hard. I mean, that's one that I hear all the time mm. and, and that we, we think very often friendship shouldn't be this way. A relationship shouldn't be this way. Life shouldn't be this way, but it, I mean, the shouldn'ting is a form of masturbation because mm. it, we're expecting that life must match some some rule book that is actually not how reality works. Oh wow! Yes, I I think honestly, uh, at least in the United States, our cultural zeitgeist here hates reality. I think mm. we hate it. I, I, mean, I, hard. <laughs> I think uh, I do think that has led to a lot of really awesome innovations such as Hollywood movies and mm-hmm. really cool stories and even like fan fiction like you can my god there's so many books you can read on the internet for free and mm-hmm. fantasies and such interesting stuff that's come out of the US but I really think our society over here struggles with how things happen as close to objective as possible we don't want we don't like it (laughs) you know and so i think we have these fake ideas like i think and then ironically some of them come from movies and books it Mm. should be like this you know in a sitcom movies and books have a huge influence on on what we think must be Right. And so we Our see in the movie, like a guy, you know, this is, a, I like to make fun of Hallmark movies um, every mm. holiday season. Like, all oh, my female friends love them. And a few of my male friends love them. And I always joke, and I'm like, these guys are literally reading a script. Like, this is the most perfect, eloquent sentence I've ever seen in a male. And no wonder he wins in the end. And the other guy is like the most stereotypical uh, male, but then I feel like this stuff infiltrates our lives. You know, it's like right. It's like we I actually dr- expect real life to match. Right. I, I think 
Sorry, go on. No, that's it. I'm, I'm agreeing. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm pro fantasy in yes. general and imagination. And I think fantasies are wonderful. I think it's helpful to know that they're fantasies. It's when we confuse fantasy with reality and we actually think our fantasies are supposed to happen and are going to happen and must happen that it's it's sometimes devastating because we might love fantasies but it is misery when it turns out that our fantasies are not going to become our our true real lives and i th- and when we have to deal with reality and we feel like we've been ripped off. I mean, I I think there can be a kind of outrage that happens when you discover that actually that was a fantasy. That that idea you had, that hope you had, it it wasn't reality. So I think that there is something consoling about reality because it allows you to accept limitations and and then see what is possible and sometimes letting go of a big desire like if someone i know you referred to someone who said he wants lots of money more time and a girlfriend let's say that he actually doesn't have the option of more time which is often the case i mean i very often we want to live forever or be a different age or look different or be in a different situation entirely. I mean, if it isn't possible, I think recognizing what isn't possible can it can be a tremendous relief. I agree. And I think that's how I've noticed people learn is through trying things out. So it's like the desire and the hope drives the mm-hmm. idea and the creativity, but then you have to put the creativity into action and mm-hmm. see how the world or the universe or people respond to it so you can get feedback. And oftentimes we learn through failure, right? Right. So like all of us probably went through something and and like when we were young, like we fantasized about somebody in our class that we wanted to fall in love with when we were like 12 years old or something. Mm-hmm. And then when we actually tried to date them or something, it went horribly wrong in the lunch you know, room or whatever. And that's yes. how we learned who we actually might love like step by step and that's you know where dating comes in or friends friends come in we we have this idea that this is gonna be our best friend and 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 Mm -hmm. younger children like to say this is my best friend we're best friends forever forever. best friends forever forever. and and then you and then when you're four in your 40s like me you 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 you, I, i love my old best friends but i'm like we don't really have too much in common and and it's good to see you or hear from you once a year but uh on a day to day, we could never coexist uh, in this way. And that's, I think that's how we learn who we are is through, through the experimentation and allowing ourselves the acceptance, which you said earlier, the acceptance of both having a desire and then how does the desire play out in action? Yes. Yes. Because clarity is kindness. It's kindness Mm -hmm. to ourselves as well. So if you if you want to be a professional dancer and you're in your 50s and it hasn't happened holding on to a rigid script about how one day it will happen I, it's it's torture and actually something else is possible but i'm making adjustments making kind of negotiating with ourselves with our own dreams and visions of of life making space for for the twists and turns rather than thinking we have to obey the masturbating fantasies from long ago i think sometimes we're we're almost secretly loyal to to old fantasies from long ago like we're dedicated to the vision we had of how how life would be when we were growing up and it would it would be structured this way and look that way and and actually you can change your mind you can update you can abandon a project you can decide that actually you don't want to write a book and you don't actually feel like it or you can take the chance of writing a book knowing that it might not succeed that's a 
That's a good one. I, you know what? You This conversation has been so rich. I'm going to just skip some of my vocabulary words because otherwise we're going to run over into dinner time. But okay. um, but uh, insight as defense, limerence, really cool words. I, I really think people need to learn or to, to read it to get the full effect because a podcast is like a cheese tray at the grocery store. You know, it's pretty nice to have a piece of cheese, but, you know, it really goes better when you have crackers and some time to sit around and have a glass of wine. So I think uh, that's why they should read the book. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, insight as a defense, something I am guilty of. Yeah. And I I am willing to be called out on it, but it's it's such an easy kind of clever trap when you can talk about issues and make links and have a sense of why something is the way it is and nothing changes. Mm. And this is where I think psychotherapists could could help people by being kind of provocative, by being openly impatient at moments. Because if you're working with someone who is really good at therapy and really not good at life, that is not, that's not enough. And I think insight can be a way of, kind of avoiding taking action. So. I think recognizing it that just because you can see the link doesn't mean problem solved. Oh, yes. You got to get messy. We can mm. all sit there with our pipe and our professor hat, you know, waxing poetic about how things should be and how we how things could be. But if we mm. don't actually take our hat off, throw our pipe down and get out there and get messy, nothing, mm. nothing does change us. And I think as a therapist, I do. I do some. I love this technique. I learned from the Ericksonians. Uh the Milton Erickson's group they have this like technique they and it's probably a motivational interviewing technique too but I say something like you know what if I said to you by next week I need you to go out there and ask one girl on a date what would you say to me mm. right or if what if I said to you you've been telling me about joining an exercise class for the last six months and I said I'm getting really annoyed and I need you to go join it and then email me. What would you say? So I pretend it's right. a, I pretend I'm doing it, but I'm not really doing it because I might piss them off. It's kind of like a coy joke. Like I just made the I made the uh I made the idea the third object instead of me saying right. directly. And it's funny, like I love a, a lot of my clients will laugh and say, Well. I'd say, fuck up. Excuse me. <laughs> this is uncensored. I'd say, screw you. Right. Or yeah. whatever. And I'd say, well, why? Right. And then we get to go into that. Well, because I, I don't want to, and, like and that's it. too uncomfortable. And that brings up a whole nother layer. Or I'd say, I had a I had somebody say last week, well, finally, you finally tell me to do something. I said, you told me you weren't going to tell me what to do. I said, well, I am now. So, right. so right. go do it. And I'm like, but I'm not re disclaimer. And I made a joke. I'm, I'm not responsible mm -hmm. for your failure. And if you have failure, then you're going to stay in therapy and keep me in business. So I hope you fail. And it was a joke. And they're like, I'm going to succeed. It was like this whole, like, we're teasing each other. But like, it kind but of. But also playing uh, fun roles. Oh, yeah. And even, even getting to kind of express some aggression. Yes. That's another major taboo. We're not supposed to kind of have aggression. Not too much unless it's on the, you know, in a sport. But actually. Yeah, I think that that being pissed off in a kind of supportive way, even as a therapist, in whatever form that takes, I, that can be really helpful and break through something rather than just being really super nice and yes, really patient forever because I, we don't have forever and and no. let's get a move on. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to say to your your client. Do you, do you refer to people who see you as clients or patients? I, I say clients because I'm up there a master's level, but yeah. I I kind of want to say what would what would you do if you had more time and and why do you need more time? Like, is that a procrastination uh -huh. tactic? What's going to change with more time and more money? Like, is that is that kind of a cover up in a way for having the courage to start now. Oh yeah. And, uh, and, and this, and I won't go into it, but this particular client would love that 
So they love, uh, I have some clients, you know, at the beginning, I feel like we have to be nice and we have to be relaxing to kind of get <laughs> people and develop the rapport. But eventually, like what you said, like you wanted a therapist to challenge you, right? And mm-hmm. I think eventually we have to be authentic and honest and go, hey, now that you're feeling a little bit better, I feel like we really got to make some progress on your goals mm-hmm. because my job is not to have you as a subscriber for life. I got a wait list mm-hmm. of people calling me. I've got to get you, I got to get you loving your life and get out there. Even if like you talked about, even if it's post-traumatic growth, even if something horrible happened to you or your family or whatever, Mm. and we're now repairing, helping you repair your entire psyche, I still want to get you enjoying life as much as you can, despite Mm. tragedy, you know? And, and, and I feel like we have to eventually get bold or what are we doing? What, why are we? Uh, are, are you just paying me to be like a nice friend? I almost turn into a, like a, I almost turn into a robot, right? Oh, oh, that's so difficult. Oh, that's so difficult. And oh, if I don't ever challenge your behavior, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. I, we as therapists have to have courage to say the difficult thing, the awkward thing, the shocking thing, not to just go along with everything, even if it's easier in the moment. And and even if it makes us temporarily unpopular, I I think that is what actual support can mean. Yes, because if you actually care, which we do about our clients, at some time we have to take a different tactic. And so, Mm. and that spurs a crisis or that spurs desire or that pushes them to, to actually start approaching all the things they said they wanted. All the yeah. things they said they wanted to get rid of, all the things they want to gain. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you go over so many concepts. You talk about Alice Miller. You talk about post traumatic growth in this book. You talk about dealing with change and how intricate it is. But there's a topic I want to really get to, which is what we shouldn't want and what we should. Uh, mm-hmm. And can you kind of elaborate on this on this topic? And I, I, I was type. We I kind of talked about it a little bit, but you talked. Uh, why do we want people out of reach? Um, we don't believe that we deserve reciprocal love or are we afraid of vulnerability? There's so many ways, like people want something that they shouldn't, quote unquote. Mm. What, can you talk about that? Any angle you want. From the time we are socialized to to speak and to go to the bathroom, we are kind of constantly navigating the rules of desire. Mm-hmm. And we go around desire. So a, a child will say, I, I want milk. And then at a certain point, that is no longer cute. And I would like water. And then it can even get to the point of pretending not to need to go to the bathroom because you don't want to kind of annoy people. And if you're if you're a real people pleaser and don't want to kind of ever be demanding. I I think that we're always negotiating what is permitted, what's okay, what we what we should want, what we should be, what we should feel. And and then there's this other kind of scandalous underground part of us, our our shadowy side. And that is thrilling and terrifying and we should marry this appropriate suitable healthy person we should not be sexually attracted to someone who is not acceptable by other people's standards but i mean that is where the thrill can also be so i think that there is something about danger and desire that sits uncomfortably nearby and we we love getting close to crossing the line and and we might not cross it but i think it's it's also why we can be drawn to transgressive art and with all of the discussion these days about the artists and whether the art should be canceled if an artist's personality turns out to be horrendous i i think actually it's not it's not despite the kind of darkness of the artist's personality it's often because 
We secretly admire the limitless boundary pushing in, in the work of someone like Picasso and Lucian Freud. And I think it's really difficult for us to, to get comfortable with that scandalous part of ourselves. But that is the best part to really explore, not necessarily act out, but like if you have the fantasy of actually disliking someone you're supposed to be very fond of and you feel aggressive rage, allow yourself to to understand what that's about rather than pretending to be pure and and thinking that you only have good thoughts. I like the lack of censorship in therapy. Absolutely. It's got to be a space where people can fully, hopefully, show up and say anything and everything that, and so they can explore how they want to balance their life. Because to be honest, a lot of famous artists, musicians, video producers, movie actors, uh, look at the whole host of historical figures that ran armies or ran countries. Uh, if you look at their lives, their lives were in terms of modern psychotherapy and what we call health and wellness, horribly unbalanced, mm. totally possibly like uh, pathological in one way or another, right? And we, and at least in the U.S. and probably the U.K. since we're a little similar, we're we are obsessed with reading and watching and learning about these lives because yeah. perhaps we are, you know, in maybe good ways, trying to be healthy and not, yeah. you know, do these heinous things, but also <laughs> because maybe we're a little jealous that they're out sure. there you know, and, and actually, you know, doing crazy things. And then we say, we, we act surprised, you know, like, yes. I'm sorry, this rock star who travels around the world for 20 years, making millions of dollars, didn't have 55 affairs. Like we're surprised mm -hmm. at this, like this person, if you listen to their music, they're, to their, they sing about it, you know? So it's like, and, and I, you know, and, and we all get to have our reactions to their art and, you know, and some of these people have done horrible things to other humans uh, because they are, they're, 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 their mind is in the art or themselves or whatever, and they sort of don't treat people nicely. And that's not good. But at the same time, it's part of the human experience. And I think perhaps yeah. that's how they were partly their horrible, unbalanced lifestyle, according to psychotherapy, is possibly mm -hmm. how they came up with these, these books or these songs or these artistic movies that challenged and and stuck out to us in our in our mm. culture and, and have stood the test of time because there's just so different and so unique and so weird. You know, I don't know. That's my thought. What what you've just said is so it's so incredibly powerful. And for me personally, as as well as professionally, I, I have just written a piece that is in Time magazine oh, cool. about this very subject, about wanting what I shouldn't end an artist who I was involved with almost 20 years ago, who, who was abusive and my mixed feelings. But mm -hmm. I, I said earlier that this is my favorite desire. It's, it's a struggle. It's also just simply true that we, we can have mixed feelings. We can have contradictory responses. We, we can make space for that and understand that and, and make choices. But I think we can be horribly reductive in thinking we're not supposed to like that person. We're not supposed to like the bad guy. We're supposed to like the bad guy as a kind of trope. But if the bad guy really hurts us, we shouldn't still want him. And I, we start kind of instructing ourselves emotionally and bossing ourselves around and then rebelling from our inner critics. And actually it is just joyously liberating to, to allow for the range that you can, you can love and hate the same person that you, you can feel all sorts of odd affection for someone who also behaved badly. And you can, you can have children and then not always want those children at 
different moments. It doesn't mean that you're going to get rid of them, but you can you can choose to get married. And that doesn't mean that you're going to want to have sex with your spouse at every moment. And once we can allow for that freedom, it's just it's just a big relief. And it also makes life more interesting and and wider and more textured and and creative. Oh yes. Thank you for saying that. Um that I that brings me to kind of kind of getting towards the the end of the podcast today, but I feel like there's this thing that happens in life. Like you talked about stagnation and not to hate on stress, but stress or perceived stress and all types of different types of stresses, I, th- according to what I've read, sort of reduce our, sometimes reduce our ability to be creative. And mm-hmm. I think if there's a way that you can be creative in your life, you don't have to be an author. You don't have to be a musician or an artist or a movie writer or, or a painter or whatever. You can live your life creatively. And I mm-hmm. think being in touch with your desires and also understanding your sort of rigid expectations or aspirations or whatever and allow you room to be creative and if you can be creative then you love your life whether you're um a janitor Mm. at safeway or Mm. a a secretary or a or a writer or a a teacher Uh, Mm. and being creative those moments allow a lot of these 12 desires to come through yes and um i think you know for the listeners you you can be creative wherever you are um but you've got to figure out the barriers to it Mm -hmm. and also as adults we have to insist on it on on playfulness and creativity because it, it stops being encouraged and and then we might kind of try to do a tick box exercise of doing a ceramics class once in a blue moon or put too much pressure on ourselves and think no i i'm going to i'm going to write a book in one burst when i quit my job and live in a log cabin somewhere and it doesn't always have to take on an extreme form but in modest everyday ways creativity can be how you set the table or experimenting in how you prepare a meal and how you use your words in a conversation and in therapy and in the way you engage with a friend, even how you think about a problem. So I I think it's that individuality that I I keep saying freedom, but that kind of stretches us to, to be unique in a certain way. Yes. Yes, it's very profound the way you've you've put that. Um, Well, I think we could probably talk for two more hours, but I'm going to probably get to my final question. But first, an observation, which is um, I really loved, and that's why I'm going to keep this book on my desk. I love that you have this glossary in the back, another textbook thing that I have not seen in a book in a while that wasn't a textbook. But Mm. you have all these terms and define, and then you can go back and see where they are in the book. And I really actually, enjoyed coming up with words as well. I, I, I <laughs> love that. Playfulness for me. It's fun because they stick. Mm. They're sticky, you know, and, and that the stories help us remember concepts. But also, obviously, I probably had a different perspective on some of these stories than you did. And you wrote it. Right. And so we all have our different impressions. But these mm. these sticky points of, of, of words and, and concepts really kind of, I think, help us learn but we don't feel like we're learning. And I think that's yeah. the biggest thing I took from the book was that you can learn from it, but you, you're you going to be entertained. Um, first oh, I'm foremost. so glad to hear you say that. I mean, I, I like the idea of learning incidentally and, and then being aware of it and intentional about making certain adjustments. But for me, the biggest problem with textbooks and self-help is that they can be boring and actually... <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, I, think, I I think therapy should also be engaging, and we need to insist on having it be fascinating. Oh yes, I mean I I can see that just 
in my life, uh, going to different therapists, but I also am a supervisor, a lot of therapists. And one of the things I do once they kind of have the basic concepts down, as I said, you don't have to bring your life, don't bring your life story into it, obviously, yeah. but bring mm -hmm. your personality into the therapy and you will be successful. I, I promise you this. That's bold of you to say, I mean, that is not the standard practice. I like it. Well, I think yeah, it's not, but I think if you look if, if you if you have uh, people in our field, when people in our field say, oh, I need a really good therapist, I really need a good therapist. Mm. Yes, sometimes we want somebody who knows how to do EMDR well, right? Mm. But but most of the time, we want someone who does EMDR well that's an interesting person. Totally. And, and we may know nothing about them, but they're interesting in the room. You know, they're, and they're, their they're, responses and their way of engaging and yeah, yeah, they're 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 authentic, they're creative, they're interesting. They they understand human condition, they understand desires. They aren't sticking in some rigid box of the medical model, and we right. that's who we seek, and that's who clients seek. Mm. I mean, I mean, I, you know, when you write a little, little profile for you know advertising or counseling practice, a lot of the first drafts of the therapist will be so <laughs> sounding like some sort of you know grad school 101 life can be hard and i can help you through being yes stuck. And, 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 and i said no 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 this is a good sentiment but you know what the heck are you passionate about who are you passionate about helping what are what problems are you helping about and what do you want to see for your clients and, and don't and, hold back oh my god and when people write and the more bizarre and the more out there the profile, the more, and I see this from the website, uh, our website and other websites, um, the more people are just hungry for that. Oh my God, somebody who wants to help me, who's trained in the science, but is is just, they really are passionate. Oh my God, I want to see them, right? And that person has a wait list of, you know, six months or something. So, you know, that's another thing. So for therapy, a lot of grad students listen to this podcast, so you know, mm. you know, learn all the behavioral stuff, learn all the rules, learn all of, you know, learn the good the techniques then... and, and have the basics and don't break ethics for God's sake, but then get really weird. And, and, mm. and, you know, this book is a good way to not only get weird, but get, get messy. You know, you get mm. really messy with desire and, uh, and I think, uh, understanding that and, 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 and stop lying to yourself. If you're a therapist, like you, you have desires and don't, you know, give me these pat answers. So that's what I want. Yeah. I want I want the listeners to hear. I like and, that. Yeah. I I really enjoyed and struggled with discovering how many layers of self deception I I've had over the years because because we're all hiding and showing parts of ourselves, but kind of camouflaging other parts and psychotherapists absolutely can hide and and i've hidden by by looking at other people more comfortably than myself and i i think that confronting self deception is is really exciting actually oh yeah and playing with it i have my yeah. favorite self deceptive um you know parts that i like to put on on purpose you know, during certain times in my life, as long as I know right. that I'm doing it, right? If right. I don't know I'm it, doing it. We all have a false self that we put on and sometimes it works for us and, and we should, we shouldn't always be authentic and radically honest in every situation. I agree. I agree. Knowing. I don't have the energy for that, to be honest. <laughs> right. And it might really just get you in trouble and be un unpleasant. And, and yet it's helpful to know that you're faking it. Oh, absolutely. And definitely it doesn't really work out well when I fake it. But you know what? Sometimes yeah. it helps me with time management and uh, and things like, who knows, whatever, you know, things like it's that. It's really or relatives. wonderful <laughs> to call yourself out for faking it in therapy as well as a therapist. Oh, completely. Client. <laughs> completely. You know, and, and being that, that honesty is what brings the depth. And that's why this mm. book reminded me of Irvin Yalom's uh, work because he in his books, he goes so deep. My God, he wrote mm. the existential psychotherapy textbook for God's sakes. And this book reminded me of his work because it's just like layer, 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 but yet Thank readable. You. So Thank you. yeah, you're welcome. So I guess my last question is, it, it is kind of the send off. Um, what have you been learning now that you wrote a book and it's, you know, published around the world and uh, by uh, Simon and Schuster, you know, what are you learning through this process? 
I, I'm learning that that learning never ends and that allowing myself to be astonished and interested in in fresh experiences is everything. I when I start saying the same thing over and over again, if I start wheeling out the same stories or kind of even like my own vulnerabilities, if I start kind of describing things using the same words again and again, I it's it's really upsetting to to go into autopilot. It happens, but I think that kind of disrupting ourselves and and paying attention to desire is always worthwhile. And again, that includes the deprivation. Like if you face that actually you, you are in love with someone and you're in love with someone who does not love you back. It is worth facing it. And it it stretches you. And I, now I feel like I'm hiding again because I'm now making it you and not me. It's okay. It's okay. I think you're trying to talk to the audience. Yeah. I really like the idea of looking up at the stars and kind of knowing that we'll never get there, but we'll always be in motion and, and we'll always be able to look up and, and see possibility. But the idea of a fulfilling life, the thing that I, I realized when I completed this book was that fulfillment is just, it's something to pursue. It's not something to have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's no there there. <laughs> yes. Yes. I wow. don't think I knew that before. I, I think I had some kind of embedded fantasy that I could find fulfillment. And and I think having a fulfilling life is absolutely worthwhile. It's just, it's it's not a final destination. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's profound and, and true because everything is, I mean, this is horrible. This is both a good and terrible concept that everything is somewhat temporary, right? It, so. Yes. So, the, uh, and it's relief at times because sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, like back to Singh and her boss, sometimes you can realize that actually you wanted to do something then and you no longer want that same thing or you you want something different you can change your mind yeah it's a relief the desire it's permanent I, I mean temporary and your circumstances are temporary and and it's kind of scary but exciting yeah it is it's it, it is it, it it is both scary and exciting and to live in that middle space which you said is like we're always learning i think is both frightening but yet invigorating. And I, I love that because I've always said the more I learn, the less I know about, I, the less I understand that I know nothing. Mm. And um, yeah. I have to keep learning from other cultures, from other books, from other perspectives. There's, mm. there's untold thousands and millions of, of perspectives on life and, and, mm. and behavior and, and love and, I think if we think that we are now we've seen it all or we Mm. or we've we've seen it all that means that you're probably in a rigid stuck or stagnant period it doesn't mean that you're right you're wrong i couldn't agree (laughs) more and that's why when i catch myself thinking i know i know where this goes then i i try to actually feel awe for the kind of mystery and discovery of whatever is there there it's always possible to feel all for something i love it um yeah thank you so much for coming on the show i i thank i you. think yeah you're welcome i you have a website charlottefoxweber.com which is i need to update it definitely way. <laughs> oh okay well you've got a couple of weeks before this goes live um but yeah do you have social are you on like social media too yes, as well i'm on instagram that's my main one, Charlotte Fox Weber psychotherapy. Oh, so you're on the, so the Instagram and the website. So a lot of people love um, the social media because it's like really quick and faster than like going to a website and reading. Oh, please. I, my, my social media is more updated as well. Oh, okay. Good, good. And um, so what you've got- What about you? Are you on Instagram? 
Oh, our our uh, my ca- my practices, yeah. So I'll I'll follow you. Uh, my, my the practice health for life counseling is is on Instagram. Yeah, we don't yeah. post too much. Just post when we ever have a blog or a, or a podcast come out. So um, it'll be on there, and we'll uh, make sure we follow you and put that out there so people can follow your work uh, that way uh, and mm-hmm. kind of be up to date. And obviously books are, are not too expensive and we have libraries. And so you can probably get it in the library or in those uh, new e-library apps I've been hearing about um, where you can actually get a book right on your phone or tablet. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that that's, that's it. Uh, and I guess this is such a stereotype question, but are you writing another book? I am. I am writing a book called Sacred Monsters. Sacred Monsters is a term borrowed from our history. It was Cocteau who first used it. And it's the way we kind of love and cherish certain beastly people. And I think that we all have our own sacred monsters. And we can hold on to hurtful relationships sometimes literally and sometimes just internally where we kind of seek reenactments and, and I certainly have, and finally have some grasp of that story. And I, I'm, I'm really excited by other people's stories because it's no longer just me hiding from myself, but also it's not too much self. So I think, I think that's, always a struggle for the writer to kind of, I don't know if you found this in your writing, but like the risk of solipsism or kind of being in an echo chamber and, and then wanting to have fresh invigorating encounters and, and experiences with other people, other viewpoints. Yeah. I, um, I write sort of amateurishly, but yes, I agree. I mean, there's that, there's part of the author that wants to go inside and and talk about their inner world and the way they see the story. But I think it sounds like you're trying to also figure out who, what other people's stories are and bring it in mm. and, and juxtapose it. So that's, I, I mean, that's exciting. So I think uh, it sounds like uh, the listeners will be able to keep following you and find out when that one comes out, when you're, whenever you're done, as I know the publishing world takes forever to get anything out, but uh, that's, that's exciting. So thank you for sharing that insight. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way every day goes. Every time we've no control. If the sky is pink and white, if the ground is black and yellow, it's the same way you show me. Nod my head, don't close my eyes. Halfway on a slow move. It's the same way you show me If you could fly then you'd feel south Up north's getting cold soon The way it is we're on land So I'm someone to hold true Keep you cool when it's still alive Won't let you down when it's all ruined Just the same way you show me Show me You showed me life. And there you have it This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Or take just a minute to give us a rating on iTunes. As most of you know, I am passionate about preventing future violence in the United States. My colleagues and I have started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, a 501c3 organization. We are endeavoring to gain funding and collaborators so that we can start a 24 7 hotline and chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. It is a bold effort to save lives and curb violence by working to connect with potential offenders while they are in the planning stages of violence help to de-escalate them, and provide resources so that they can get appropriate professional help. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and the solutions. You can learn more by visiting our website, www.violencepreventionhotline.org. Join us online by signing our petition on the website, sharing the website with your network of people, 
donating to the cause if you like, and you can now even write your congressperson from our website with a simple form. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are a therapist and looking for ethical and excellent medical billing services, check out therapistbillingservicesllc.com. That's www.therapistbillingservicesllc.com. Billing services created by therapists for therapists. If you're looking for an EMDR International Association consultant, I am a consultant and I can provide you the 20 hours you need to become EMDRIA certified. I have groups online and in person, and I do individual consultation. Just send me a message at the website and I'll get back to you. If you want to get trained in EMDR therapy, check out the great training opportunities with EMDR Training Solutions. I've worked with them before and they are phenomenal, so register today. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment at a local counseling center in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based on the literature they have read and the experience in their fields, this should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you're in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. You can also text 741741 and a live trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping at www.bookshop.org? You can order from the comfort of your own home online while supporting local brick-and-mortar businesses near you. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your national or local therapy organization, such as the American Counseling Association or the American Mental Health Counselors Association, please get involved. At least pay the dues. It will help the lobbyists in our field keep us from becoming gig workers. And of course, there's the bonus of increasing mental health education around the United States and helping people understand what counseling is and promoting best practices within our profession. Until next time, I wish you all a safe and peaceful week. Just a night, night, night